thank you so much, Jenny, and um, thank you all for being here today. Special thanks to Florence for her wonderful presentation on the important issue of concrete and construction, which has so many applications for our environment, for our world use of natural resources, and certainly for our world economy. And I want to thank you for this wonderful turnout. I don't quite know what you're expecting today, but uh, I hope the food is good. Um, thank you all so much for coming from your very busy schedules to uh, join in this faculty assembly. I think it's so important for you all to come because when you consider the size of our faculty, the breadth of the disciplines, it is really quite rare that we come together as a faculty of Vanderbilt. And I think it shows very, very well, particularly for our new colleagues, that it is so well attended. Um, I think it's also very important that we come together regularly to celebrate our faculty, for it is you, the faculty, who in effect are the university, your achievements, your teaching, your research. So much of what you do really tells us what Vanderbilt stands for, how healthy Vanderbilt is intellectually and financially, and therefore, Thank you so much for coming to recognize so many of your colleagues. Um, we're going to start out by recognizing those faculty who have 25 years of service. I will remind you later that I'm at 22, and so I'm not close to getting this chair, or I might mention no other chair that comes to faculty. But it is really a special occasion to recognize those people who have dedicated almost their entire or a large part of their professional lives to this great university. Uh, we recognize them with a chair, and um, they are entitled to choose between rocking or other ones. <laughs> Ginny, I'm shutting this down. Uh, from the College of Arts and Science, David Lee Carlton, Arthur A. Demers, Marshall C. Aiken, and Timothy B. McNamara, and Gerald Sutton. could not join us today. Um, no doubt, very busy at work around travel. I want to recognize John W. Brock III, uh, David H. Johnson, Patrick Lavin, Thomas L. McCurley III, James S. Powers, and Stephen R. Sheck. Please join me in recognizing our very special opportunity to present the Chancellor's Awards for Research. The fact that we're receiving these awards for outstanding leadership and excellence in research, scholarship, and creative expression in work that has been published or presented in the past three years. This award carries a stipend of $1,000 and an engraved pewter julep cup. I want to recognize my colleague and former faculty chair, Jim Blumstein, 
and I believe it was under Jim's leadership that these new awards were put in place to recognize our outstanding faculty. Now, after a thorough and careful consideration of the nominees, the following individuals have been selected to receive this year's Chancellor's Awards. Michael Goldfarb, Professor of Mechanical Engineering. So here's our applause. Transactions on Mechatronics and Journal of Dynamic Systems, Measurement and Control, which were published in IEEE and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Michael's research on the development of monopropellant actuators promises to revolutionize the powering of robots and prosthetic devices. He has pioneered the development of liquid-fueled actuators, which are capable of power, powering artificial limbs, but do not carry the heavy burden of extra weight, like batteries and electrical actuators. This new technology has brought huge advancements to enhancing human physical capabilities. Michael's use of the gentle hydrogen peroxide, a green chemical monopropellant to power pneumatic actuators for high power robots, prosthetics, and exoskeletons, is 10 times more powerful than battery power actuators. This is simply amazing research and application is unique throughout the world. It is garnering national and international recognition. And if you want to have a very interesting uh, visit, go see his laboratory. Congratulations, Michael. <laughs> Douglas G. McMahon, Professor of Biological Sciences, received the Chancellor's Award for his article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and the Journal of Neuroscience. Doug, Doug's research focuses on, on the dopaminergic neuron function in the eye, and his findings give greater understanding to the mechanisms that allow us to see over enormous ranges of light intensity. Previous research in neurobiology has shown that our eyes automatically adjust to more than a trillion-fold span of dim to bright illumination conditions with the chemical neurotransmitter we've all heard of, dopamine, restructuring retinal circuits in response to changing illumination. What was not understood, however, was how dopaminergic neurons responded to light. What was the mechanism? Doug realized that direct measurements of molecular and physiological responses of these neurons were needed, but it was problematic. Of the millions of neurons in the eye, only 500 are dopamine neurons. To overcome this difficulty, Doug developed a unique method to mark dopaminergic neurons genetically in mice, allowing these neurons to be easily seen in the living eyes and brains. By introducing a gene promoter that encodes a red fluorescent protein, the dopamine neurons glow red, making it possible for these sparse neurons, the needles in the haystack, to be easily located in living neural circuits. The results of these studies have been profound, for they have clarified how dopamine preserves our vision across a wide range of illumination conditions. But significantly, this research extends well beyond visual neuroscience. We all know dopamine is a critical transmitter. It mediates basic mechanisms of the mind, such as controlling movement, motivation, and mood. And the development of this mechanism for detection, the red glowing dopamine neuron mouse in his research, establishes key experimental tools and holds great potential in better understanding how this neurotransmitter, dopamine, contributes to Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, and addiction. And addiction. Congratulations, Doug. This is remarkable work. Our next Chancellor's Award goes to Tracy Miller. Uh, my uh, script here says Tracy is an assistant professor of art. September 1, the clock rolls over and she was uh, tenured this year and she will be promoted to associate professor. 
Uh, she has been elected to, selected to serve, receive a Chancellor's Award for her remarkable book, The Divine Nature of Power, Chinese Architecture at the Sacred Site of Jing Shi. Tracy is a specialist, Tracy, come on. Tracy is a specialist in the history of Chinese art, architecture, and visual culture, and has garnered an impressive international reputation in this important field. In this book, described repeatedly as one of the very finest accounts ever written on Chinese architectural history, she used an interdisciplinary approach, incorporating the findings of archaeologists, anthropologists, and religious, social, and art historians. Through her research, she sheds light on the wealth and diversity of meanings projected by sacred buildings and religious art and their ability to create divinity among the various groups of patrons. Tracy's writing, The Divine Nature of Power, is a brilliant piece of work published in several languages with in-depth information about this actual site, one of the very most important shrines in East Asia. Her command of both classical and modern Chinese enabled her to engage both Chinese and Japanese specialists in her project to a degree that is highly unusual, indeed almost unprecedented, for Western scholars. This is really important research, and Tracy, congratulations on this great book and your promotion. Associate Professor of Psychology for his articles in Nature Neuroscience and Current Biology on Mind Reading. <laughs> Through the use of novel applications of statistical tools, Frank and his colleagues were able to predict what people were seeing based on the functional activity of their brain. His research on decoding the visual and subjective contents of the human brain explores the potential for neuroimaging to read out the detailed contents of a person's mental state, an area of study that is profound and is obviously yet to be fully explored. Studying these complex processes, such as how the brain fills in blind spots that exist in each of our eyes, Frank's findings have brought serious and important understanding to how the brain fills in information that is not visually present. Professor Tong Frank has established himself as an expert at a very early point in his career, I might add, on issues that lie at the intersections, the heart of the intersections of cognitive psychology, neuroscience, and increasingly, he and his colleagues in our fabulous neuroscience program are looking at the intersection with philosophy and law. His work has received international recognition as one of the most creative de uh, demonstrations of the power of functional neuroimaging to index mental states. This is absolutely fascinating work. Congratulations, Frank. Chancellor's Research Award is presented to our colleague, Mark Walliger, Associate Professor of English, who next month will be promoted to professor. He receives this award for his remarkable book, Modernism, Media, and Propaganda, British Narrative from 1900 to 1945. Mark's research and writing on the nature of modernism delves into its cultural, its historical, and its political impact. A wide range of subjects are explored, from high culture to low culture, from Ulysses, which one, <laughs> to recruitment posters for World War I, to propaganda films produced by the British Ministry of Information. What a gift it is to have Mark at our university. He explains in his book that modernism as a technique is basically the opposite of propaganda in that it stands for a way of seeing and responding to the complexity of life. 
the vital human experience. To understand these complex issues, Mark argues modernism is essential to the functioning of our society. Despite the exhaustive amount of research into many different corners necessary to cre create a book of this magnitude and order, the clarity of its language, its readability, make it greatly appealing not just to a scholarly audience, but to a wide audience, and certainly anyone interested in the nature of modernism. Mark, come forward and receive this well-deserved award. We turn now to the Thomas Jefferson Award. Since 1967, the Thomas Jefferson Award has been presented to a faculty member for distinguished service through extraordinary contributions in the councils and governing, governance of the university. This award carries an engraved goblet and a nice $2,500 cash prize. Throughout the span of this 41-year time period, I would venture to say that never has there been a recipient of this award who has served on more search committees to kill key university, to fill key university positions. <laughs> I don't know, he might have been on the animal care. <laughs> sure he was, Randolph. The altruistic service rendered by this year's recipient of the Jefferson Award has played a vital role in building and strengthening his faculty organization and its administration. I will add, he did all of this while being a tremendous teacher and internationally recognized scholar as well. In recognition of his many years of service, we are very proud to present Randolph Blake, Centennial Professor of Psychology, the 2008 He came to Vanderbilt from Northwestern University in 1988 to chair the Department of Psychology in the College of Arts and Science, a position he held for eight years. His first order of business, and in any department, this was be, would be a tall order, was to reorganize, streamline, and focus this department from seven areas into three. And as somebody who has worked on these sorts of things, there are rarely four volunteers who step forward. This is difficult work. During the course of his 20 years at the university, Randolph, uh, with his colleagues, really built a world-class psychology department. But he has also served on the Peabody Dean Search Committee in 1992. 1993, he chaired the Arts and Science Dean Search Committee, while simultaneously serving on the Provost Search Committee. He was a member of the search committees for the directors of the Vanderbilt Imaging Center and the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center. And the University Research Council and the Neuro Council have, Neuroscience Council have benefited enormously from Randolph's terms of service, as have our great Vanderbilt Vision Research Center and, of course, our Center for Integrative and Cognitive Neuroscience. But it is perhaps being asked by his colleagues to serve as chief of staff of the Chancellor's Search Committee that best reflects the enormous respect and high esteem that so many throughout the university hold for Randolph. Now this is a little difficult for me because Randolph was chief of staff for the search that I got and so I don't know if that detracted from the award, Randolph. This uh, came to me as a strong recommendation and I am pleased to approve this selection. Um, the Chancellor Search Committee was conducted under very strict conditions of confidentiality. And that is not easy to do to conduct a search in that fashion. No one can describe in complete detail the multitude of demands, much less the multitude of constituencies Randolph had to listen to and balance them up. Sitting, of course, in the room with our trustees, which was new and learning terrain for him. This will call for a calm, cool, collected ambassador who was widely respected 
and could juggle the many interests. It required this thoughtful person that we know as Randolph, a great citizen, for brilliantly, for, for, for brilliantly fulfilling so many roles, and we'll put aside the chance of search, for his strong commitment to the university, and for the many times you have made personal and pre professional sacrifices for the Betterment University, I present the Thomas Jefferson Award to our great colleague, Randolph Gray. Now we come to the Earl Sutherland Prize for achievement in research at Vanderbilt. It goes without saying that this is the most prestigious honor, the most prestigious honor that Vanderbilt and the faculty bestow in recognition of a faculty member's accomplishments in research, scholarship, or creative expression. This award has been called, rightly, the Nobel Prize of Vanderbilt. The prize consists of $5,000 and an engraved pewter julep cup. The winner's name is added to a silver bowl following a design by no less than Paul Revere. The recipient actually gets to keep that bowl for one year. It is my tremendous honor and it is my great privilege to stand before you and to announce that this year's recipient of the Sutherland Prize is our great colleague and my friend, Lynn Goodman. And we now Professor of the Humanity, and Professor of the Lynn joined the Vanderbilt community in 1994 after teaching at the University of Hawaii where he had been a faculty member since earning a Doctor of Philosophy degree from Oxford University. Lynn is a specialist in both Jewish and Islamic philosophy, with a keen interest in the creative ex interactions of these two philosophical lines of thoughts and inquiry. He has been the recipient of so many honors and awards, to mention only a few, the National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, the Baumgart Memorial Award of the American Philosophical Association and a Lippmann Fellow at the Oxford Center for Postgraduate Hebrew Studies. Respected as an intensely thoughtful and prolific writer whose record of scholarly achievements is noteworthy for its breadth, its depth, its rigor, and for its enduring impact. Len is the author of 13 books, 10 edited volumes, 84 published articles, and nearly 36 review articles. He is perhaps the best known for this remarkable work, God of Abraham, which has been described as by a leader in the field as one of the greatest works of Jewish philosophy of the last 100 years. In his most recent book, Love Thy Neighbor as Thyself, based on his 2005 Gifford Lectures at the University of Glasgow, he invokes the philosophy of Aristotle, Spinoza, and Kant, and interweaves the wisdom of these 3,000 years worth of Jewish text, along, however, with a very deliberate, rigorous, careful consideration of Muslim and Christian theology to answer some of the most important, significant philosophical questions of our time. Len acknowledges in Love Thy Neighbor that in today's society, the world in which we live, when traditional religious thought collides inevitably with that of natural science, it can spark ferocious dissent, disagreement, and debate. But Len stresses this situation, while not trivial, is nonetheless minor when compared to the critical problem of reconciling religious faith with the democratic principles of religious pluralism. He focuses our attention to urgent need for love and open-minded reflection on the simple phrase, the things of others. 
to quote a few of Len's peers and colleagues, both here at Vanderbilt, but importantly, across the globe. His combined knowledge of the Western Judaic and Islamic traditions in religion and philosophy is unparalleled, unparalleled in our world today. He has set an example of scholarship that probably has no equal in our profession. There are simply no philosophers writing today who can match Goodman's achievement in reaching out to the Islamic and Jewish traditions of moral thought. And this sentiment struck me deeply. His in an, is an achievement in which the dignity of all of us, of what we could be, is mirrored and confirmed. In this day and age when our world at, time, at times seems rife with a lack of understanding for others, the drawing of sharp lines, differences culturally, nationally, the prevailing attitude leads towards one of intolerance for religious beliefs that do not neatly fit what one conceives as one's own. We at Vanderbilt are truly, I will say, Len, blessed to have a scholar in our midst, a friend to, to so many of us who possesses and demonstrates in both word and deed a deep and meaningful commitment to the tenets of truth, morality, and loving kindness. Len's work is marked by an energy, an originality that is profound. He has made significant, lasting contributions, as we all hope to do, not just to our campus community, but to philosophical thinking for years, decades to come. He is, without any doubt, richly deserving of our highest honor, the 2008 Earl Sutherland Prize for Achievement Research. Len, please join me on the stage.